Do I grab his head? Boom, pull the uh, bolt back. If anyone in that house deserved it, I did. This is Isaiah Sweet. When he was four years old, he was adopted by his grandparents, Janet and Richard. 13 years later, he repaid them by shitting them in the head. They raised me since I was four and I never faded much. <laughs> what drove Isaiah to murder his grandparents in such a gruesome way? Had there been warning signs? And was it more nature or nurture in his case? We'll explore these questions and many more in today's outrageous case, but be warned, we'll be discussing against a minor, extreme violence, and this is the full story of Isaiah Sweet. It was Mother's Day 2012, and Rick and Janet Sweet's family came over for a visit. It was a yearly tradition to celebrate Mother's Day together at the Sweet residence in Manchester, Iowa. But this time, something was off. The house was awfully quiet, almost as if the couple had forgotten about their little party. When their family knocked on the door, no one answered. So they started looking at windows. Indeed, one was broken. You know that morbid curiosity we all sometimes have? Well, they peered through the broken window, and that's when they saw Rick and Janet slumped over the couch. Everything was drenched in blood. There is definitely a body inside, and I noticed a gunshot wind uh, through the window, and so rather than go in and explore, we're calling you. When the officers arrived, they entered the house and saw a sight that would stick with them forever. Rick's brain was oozing out of his head. Whoever had sh them really wanted them dead. This wasn't just a robbery gone wrong. As the detectives were trying to draw a suspect list, they asked the Sweet family if Rick and Janet lived with anyone else. That's when the name Isaiah Sweet came up. Isaiah was their 17-year-old grandson. He'd been living with them for 13 years, and now he was nowhere to be seen. When the officers heard this, they worried for Isaiah. Perhaps he'd also been a victim of this cold-blooded so they sent out to find him ASAP, but he wasn't in Manchester. Some 24 hours after finding the bodies and almost 48 hours after the murders, the police finally found Isaiah in Cedar Rapids. He was coming from Iowa City, 75 miles away. He'd been partying with friends. Now he was walking toward a park. When he saw the detectives rushing toward him, Isaiah tried to outrun them. Then he heard the police dogs barking, so he quickly surrendered. This was already odd. The police didn't consider him a suspect, so why was he trying to avoid them? On May 14th, Isaiah Sweet was brought in to the police station, but not inside an interrogation room. He was brought into the detective's office, and Detective Scott Rieger created a laid-back, friendly atmosphere for Isaiah. Get those things off you. Fight them a little bit better. Oh, yeah. You're gonna be good with me, right? Yes, sir. All right. Scott offered Isaiah food, soda, and even free refills. He wanted Isaiah to feel at home with him. This way, Isaiah would be prompted to open up and be completely honest. This worked incredibly well. I'm gonna show you this here. This is called a statement of rights and an acknowledgement of the waiver, okay? Right, right to remain silent. Anything I say can and will be used against yep. me in a court of law. I'll write to an attorney if I cannot afford one, one will be appointed to me. You've got those things down already, yes, sir. He was bragging about knowing his Miranda rights, but what he was really saying was that he had multiple run-ins with the police before. Between March 2011 and April 2012, the police had been called 18 times to the Sweet residence. First, it was a little family dispute, according to the police report. Then it got worse and worse. When he was 16, Isaiah quit high school. He had learning disabilities, which always placed him at the bottom of his class. And over the last few years, he'd fallen in with the wrong crowd. He was doing hard jobs like mean and disappearing from home for days on end. His grandparents were worried sick, but the tighter their leash, the more aggressive he got. Rick called the police after Isaiah kicked him in the stomach, threatened to hurt him and his wife, and even attempted to start a fire inside their home. Things were getting out of control, but Janet didn't want Isaiah prosecuted. She just wanted him, quote, back under control. Of course, Scott already knew about these calls when he interviewed Isaiah, but he played the father figure to make Isaiah feel safe. Go ahead, bow down. When was the last time you had something to eat? Four days ago. You haven't eaten anything in four days? All right. And we got more food, so if you wallow that stuff down, you want to keep going, we've got more food, we can keep it coming. Yeah, you guys make me feel like right? I didn't do anything yeah. wrong. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, let's put it like this. I'm not going to be lying to you guys about anything you ask me. I appreciate that. 
Rarely do you see such cooperation with the police. Even innocent people are a bit reluctant when they're being questioned. Isaiah didn't consider keeping anything away from the cops. He didn't even want a lawyer, even though he knew the Miranda rights by heart. Then Scott was preparing to ask Isaiah some questions about his family and the context of the murders, but he never suggested that he might think that Isaiah was guilty. However, Isaiah started speaking about the murders unprompted. So what I want you to do right now is just kind of relax, go ahead and eat that food, kind of mount down. Like I said, I want to kind of start and kind of walk back through some things first. All right. Okay. More than anything, I want to know what brought me to what I did, what's wrong with me. Sure. Then, you know... No, like, I'm about to start bawling. Okay. Hey, Isaiah, if you if you cry, I, that's totally fine, man. I respect that, okay? You're so, up. I want to go back so bad. How come? Because I love them so much, and they didn't deserve that. Within minutes, Scott had a full confession from Isaiah. How come they didn't deserve it? <laughs> if anyone that else deserved it, I did. More okay. than anyone. <laughs> you take your time, brother. They raised me since I was four and I never faded much. <laughs> but the story of Isaiah's childhood is a murky one. Isaiah Sweet was born in 1995 in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. For the first four years of his life, he lived with his mother, Stacy. But he wasn't a happy boy. Can you recall your first positive memory as a child? Positive memory. Um, positive is hard. Um, good boy. Stacy had a severe drug addiction problem with the worst you can imagine. Sadly, her son would fall into the same trap years later. This meant that Stacy often neglected little Isaiah. She wasn't prepared to be a parent because she wasn't an adult. Uh, I mean, obviously she was 18 when she had me, 20 when she had my brother, I believe. And she was acting like a child in her 20s. And here's a really tragic twist. When he was four years old, Isaiah was by a neighbor. This was the last straw for Stacy's parents, Janet and Rick. They started a long fight to revoke Stacy's parental rights and become Isaiah's legal guardians. If she couldn't keep her eyes on her son, they would. Isaiah's brother went to live with his dad and Isaiah was taken in by Rick and Janet. But this wasn't a happy ending for Isaiah. Some of his earliest bad memories involved Janet being physically active to him. My grandma be with a golf club. I was playing miniature golf in the living room with this plastic golf set. It was hard plastic. And um, she came in and told me I couldn't be doing it in the house and took it hit me with it and it broke my arm. And she made me go fall on my bike in front of the neighbors so I couldn't say anything happened. Isaiah was only six when this horrible ordeal happened. For him, his grandparents weren't his saviors or his parents in any way. He saw them as enemies from day one. Janet and Rick would continue to threaten Isaiah into submission. The main threat was that if he said anything, Child Protection Services might take him away for good. The DHS had already taken him away from Stacy. That was traumatic enough for a four-year-old, so Isaiah's grandparents knew exactly which buttons to push to keep their a secret. They were always telling me, like, you can't tell DHS anything that happens here. It'll take you away. You'll never get to see anybody again. And it was just in my head that you don't talk about what happened at home from a very young age. When Isaiah was seven or eight, the family moved to Manchester, Iowa. This was a big change for Isaiah, but Rick and Janet didn't change. Rick would drink a dozen beer cans during the day at work, and then he would continue drinking at home too. I never saw him sober one day in my life, living from the age of four to 17. It gets worse. When he was drunk, Rick would sometimes touch Isaiah inappropriately, or even have Isaiah touch him. To me, it didn't, to me it didn't really register, but now I understand that it's weird and inappropriate and sick. Like he'd ask me, oh, you going here down there? Yeah, let me see, stuff like that. Needless to say, Rick and Janet would also fight with each other. Isaiah even witnessed them splitting their heads open with kitchen utensils. When Janet couldn't take it anymore, she would take her anger out on Isaiah. When Isaiah was a young teenager, the DHS took him to a mental evaluation. He was in a mental health institution for six days, and it was there that he received a diagnosis. Uh, ADHD, bipolar, and hypersexuality. 
but he had been diagnosed with ADHD very early on. When he was four, he was prescribed a very nasty type of medication. He prescribed Adderall and Ritalin since the age of four. So four to 17, they had me on insults for ADHD. So you're basically given a child in prescription form his entire childhood. Prescribing medication like this to a young child can lead to serious narcotic addiction later on. The body gets used to needing that substance and the mind will do anything to get it after the prescriptions stop coming. Isaiah was not in a good place, ever. But let's go back to the interrogation and see how he describes murdering his grandparents. Because the way he talked about it shocked Scott and everyone else on the case. These weren't the words of a sad victim. After Isaiah started crying about killing his grandparents, Scott wanted to get an exact description of what happened that day. Shot both of them. Okay. <laughs> What'd you shoot him with, Isaiah? The assault rifle. An assault rifle? You remember what it looks like? It's black. Okay. With the... Black, bolt action, 10 or more round clip. It's a uh, Czechoslovakian. Notice how Isaiah's demeanor immediately changed when he started talking about the murder weapon. He was almost proud to know all of its details and let Scott know he knew how to use such a big rifle. Then, Scott asked Isaiah to walk him through the events of Friday, May 12th. Isaiah got the rifle from his grandparents' bedroom, loaded it with 10 bullets, and then headed upstairs. Walked up the stairs, took like a point like this, I had earmuffs on and everything. I took a point like this, stepped up one stair so I could see my grandpa's head. Boom, pulled the trigger back, pulled the uh, bolt back, shot my grandpa twice in the head. Rick and Janet were killed on the spot as they were sitting on the sofa, but Isaiah didn't just run away. Then okay. I went up to him and I just broke down and started crying. I told him how much I loved him. I'm trying to get myself every single night since it happened. I just want to know what's wrong with me. Here, Scott assured Isaiah that there was nothing wrong with him and even had him say it back. You're a normal smart kid, right? Okay, you're nodding in your head at me, yes, all right? Scott also told Isaiah that he'd spoken to his friends and family and that everyone said he was smart and normal. You might think Scott was just trying to flatter Isaiah and make him feel at ease, but by now, Scott had a murder confession. By establishing Isaiah was mentally stable, he could prove that Isaiah was in control of his actions. He wasn't suffering a psychotic or schizophrenic episode, and what he did was his decision. The question that remained, was it premeditated? When I went downstairs, first, I was just gonna hit both in the head with a bat. Okay. So it wouldn't be so messy, you know, wouldn't be gunshot from an extremely loud assault rifle. Sure. What's going through your mind and when you're making that choice? When I came up, I came up right behind my grandpa when he was washing ditches with a bat in my hand. I put it right behind his head, came back like this, and I couldn't do it. Not only did Isaiah agree to premeditation, but he admitted he attempted murder 15 times over that Friday. And I came up behind him about 15 different times and he didn't notice me once. What about your grandma? Nope. Isn't it funny Isaiah mentioned he chose the rifle as a less messy method, but what he did that night was extremely gruesome. The gunshot woke her up. Okay, the gunshot when you shot your grandma? She didn't know what to do. She looked over and her husband was hanging out of his head. Like, I'm not even being exaggerative at all. Sure, and I wasn't up there. Like this whole part of his head right here was gone. And then my grandma's right here, all that was gone. As Isaiah was describing more and more of his Friday night, his demeanor was getting increasingly psychopathic, as if he was proud of his deeds. I went, shot my grandpa, he just dropped. And I heard him pouring out of his head. My grandma looks over and she's like, what's going on? Boom, shot right there, grazed her head. And she was still moving. So I shot her right here, through okay. her head. Then comes the bragging. How close were you, Isaiah? Um, I could have made the shot from 300 yards. I'm an amazing shot, but I was probably like 10, 15 feet away. If that, <laughs> okay. well, honestly, from the barrel of the gun to my grandpa's head, six, eight feet. Was Isaiah genuinely feeling remorse over killing his grandparents earlier in the interrogation, or was he feigning remorse to get empathy or even food from the detectives? 
Did you check to see if they had a pulse? Did you check them at all? Like her was the whole side of her face off. So okay. it's his, so it, like his was like on the coffee okay. table. Needless to say, he didn't check their pulse. But that doesn't mean Isaiah didn't go over and touch them. Here's the creepiest part yet. Okay. Yeah. But she didn't go over yeah. and, you know, just to, just to double I check. I kissed both of them and then packed my left. Okay, why'd you kiss them? Because I love them. How conflicted can a person be? Would you shoot and kiss someone within a few minutes? Was there any real remorse then? According to Isaiah, the minute he killed his grandparents, he realized how wrong it was. Right away, I wanted to take it back. I don't know why I did it. <laughs> but then again, he switched his behavior from crying to jolly to cooperative. He told Scott all about his two days on the run. He met with his ex-girlfriend in Cedar Rapids and went partying with several friends. Are these the clothes that you were wearing when you shot your grandpa and grandma? Yes, sir. Okay. Is there any blood on them? From my finger. So did he really kiss his grandparents' bodies if there's no blood on his t-shirt? Oh, uh, actually, I, I was wearing sweatpants and no shirt when I shot. Okay. Where's because I didn't want to get blood on these jeans or the shirt. Then Isaiah bragged about making sure there was no grandparent DNA on his clothes or possessions. Like this made him extra smart. But if he did kiss his grandparents, then there would be some DNA on him. A minute later, Isaiah was describing picking up a chunk of his grandma's head from the floor. I picked it up and I looked at it and I could see it was from my grandma. Didn't, didn't that freak you out a little bit, kinda? Kinda? I, I was like, oh, well, I'm a psychotic murderer anyway, so it doesn't okay. really matter. Isaiah Sweet can contradict his own statements a lot. Before ending the interrogation, Scott asked Isaiah if there was anyone else involved in the murders. So he quickly gave his friend away. I gave the assault rifle to Brandon Allers, gave the TV to Brandon Allers. So you didn't throw it? You didn't throw away nope. the, the... Nope. That's because Isaiah had previously said he'd wanted to throw away the rifle on Highway 13. Isaiah implicated Brandon in a number of ways. He confirmed Brandon came to the suite residence right after Isaiah killed Janet and Rick, and he also said that Brandon wanted to steal Rick's truck, so he knew about the murder plan too. He was the one who gave me the nicotine poisoning suggestion. I thought you said you got that over the internet. Nope. I was him. This means, on the one hand, Isaiah was lying to Scott again. On the other hand, he wasn't immediately remorseful about the murders. If he had guests over willingly and let them steal his victim's car, how could he feel remorse? Then Scott left the interrogation room and another detective came in with more food. Watch how Isaiah talks about his mom. Ooh, she doesn't even know her parents her. are dead. Oh, she doesn't know at all? No, she doesn't know her parents are dead. When Scott came back in to wrap it up, Isaiah said he was hoping to just get shot by the police instead of getting arrested. I just wanted to get shot. Why do you want to get shot? So that I wouldn't have to Okay. Why didn't you want to get yourself? Because it was too damn hard. It just didn't work, ever. But when the police surrounded Isaiah on May 14th, he immediately surrendered. So is he being sincere at all? Isaiah's outrageous interrogation was the main clue in the case. Without being prompted, he bragged about murdering his grandparents, insisted that he was unusually smart, and confessed to a long list of crimes, including attempted murder and premeditated murder. Not much else was needed in his trial. But if more evidence was needed, here's Isaiah's Twitter. His bio painted him as a cool kid, at least in his mind. Then after murdering his grandparents, Isaiah made a series of questionable and worrying comments. And here are Isaiah's text messages to and from a friend on the day of the murders. So he also admitted to car theft, among other things. It turns out that Isaiah told everyone he'd murdered his grandparents except his own mom. Then when a friend sent him a picture of his house being investigated by police, he snapped his phone in half and attempted to escape justice. Here's an interesting catch. Isaiah had been arrested one day before his final arrest. He'd been partying with his friends when they decided to try and break into a fast break store. The alarm went off and the group got arrested. When the police found knives and drugs, in Isaiah's truck, they took him to the station and held him in custody for six hours. During these hours, he continued to tweet very weird comments and one indicating exactly where he was. Damn, can't wait to get out of the cop shop. The police told Isaiah he couldn't be released without an agreement from his legal guardians. Well, that was impossible. 
He'd just killed them. But Isaiah talked his way out of this. He convinced the cops that Janet and Rick were on a fishing trip in Minnesota and had limited service. So he asked the cops to call his mom and she agreed to release him to his therapist, Candace. Candace worked as an aggression replacement therapy teacher. She'd been helping Isaiah to control and regulate his emotions, but sadly, his emotions were impossible to regulate that Friday. Isaiah was taken to her home, where he ate sausage, eggs, and hash browns. Once again, Isaiah lied to the detective when he said he hadn't eaten in four days. Of course he lied. People don't walk or talk normally after four days with no food. And after Isaiah left Candace's home, she was shocked to find a handgun inside her home. That's when she called the cops and said this might have been Isaiah's doing. Isaiah denied leaving the gun there, but this tiny event was just another piece to the puzzle. During his trial, Isaiah was painted as a narcissistic, psychopathic killer. Did anybody even try to go to my phone records? That's, that's one of the things that we commonly do, is we try and get phone records. Yep. yep. And every if you have murder charges or something felony like that, you can get phone records like that. Yeah, how do you know that? I don't understand. The word psychopath was heard a lot as Isaiah bragged and showed little empathy towards his victims. He was a psychopath and to this day has no empathy. This cannot be healed by medicine and you cannot teach a person how to feel. Isaiah Sweet became the first ever Iowa teenager to receive a life sentence without the possibility of parole. A confessed teenage murderer will spend the rest of his life behind bars with no chance of parole. A judge sentenced Isaiah Sweet today for the murders of his grandparents, Richard and Janet Sweet. But sentencing a minor to life without parole is unconstitutional today. So Isaiah's defense team eventually obtained a parole date for him just four years after the murders, when Isaiah turned 21. To this day, he remains in prison and his parole attempts keep getting rejected. But he has since earned a career readiness certificate and completed some rehabilitation programs. It seems like he is slowly becoming a more thoughtful, responsible adult. Was his psychopathy and murderous thinking a result of a very traumatic childhood? My grandpa called me a piece of shit every night of my life and every day. That he constantly told me to just myself or fall off the earth. Or was he just a bad seed who exploded when it was all too much? Thanks for watching, you guys. What do you think about this case? Will Isaiah ever get released? And should he? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. And before you go, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more. Till next time.